We are like clay, static, unrecognizable, nothing. A formless mass with no direction, no purpose, no meaning. We are like clay, pliable, movable, moldable. In the hands of the Creator, we can be changed, made beautiful, given life. Nothing becomes something extraordinary. The transformation takes time. The process is tedious, difficult, painstaking. But soon, we see the beginnings of something wonderful. The formless takes shape. The unrecognizable finds its identity. The meaningless is given purpose. From nothing comes beauty. We are like clay, each piece different than the next, given unlimited potential in the hands of the potter. Let's praise the Lord this morning. Praise is rising. I find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy all I praise is Hosanna, Hosanna, come out your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus.
Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Yes, they are. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away, Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises, Hosanna. this morning to our live stream uh, of our service, and uh, we're so glad that you decided uh, to join us this morning or even join us after the fact, uh, and uh, we're just so glad to be able to worship the Lord together. Well, one of the things we uh, began last week was this new series, uh, The Discipleship Pathway, and uh, we've been looking at the steps uh, that we see as, as vital to uh, take place in the Christian's life. And in that song we just sang, we kept singing that refrain, Hosanna, Hosanna. It's a, it's a word that means, Lord, save us. And that's really our cry when we come to Christ, uh, when we accept Christ, is that cry of, Lord, save me, save us. Uh, it's only through the Lord that we can be saved. It's only by calling out to Him that we can be saved. But that's not where the Christian life ends. It's not a, a once and then where that's it that, that God does in our life. But what we read in Scripture is that's the first step in a journey that we take with God as He perfects us and as He forms us. And that was that video that we started out with, was the potter forming the clay. And in Scripture, in Romans 8, Paul says this, We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. What Paul is saying here, he's speaking, first of all, about the fact that many of us face challenges in our life, face sufferings, face difficulties. And a lot of times when we're in those places, we, we begin to lose sight of where God's leading us. We maybe lose sight of God's promises. And what Paul is reminding the Roman Christians here is that if God is the one who saves us, if it's all his work, if he has predestined us, if it is him that's called us, if it's him that has sent his son to save us, surely he can carry on his work until we are formed and conformed to the image of Christ. And so when we face those things, we're standing on God's promises. It's standing on those promises that leads to change, to growth in our lives. And so let's sing about those promises that God uh, get, has given to us and are the means by which we can change. Let's worship together.
Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I now can see Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God on the promises of Christ the Lord bound to him eternally by love's strong cord overcoming daily with the spirit sword standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior standing standing I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all and all Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God One more time Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen, amen. God has promised so much to each and every one of us. And because he is faithful to fulfill his promises, we can stand firm upon them. We can rest assured that what the Lord says he will do, he will in fact do. And one promise in which I find comfort is John 16, 22 to 23, which reads, Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take that joy away. In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. There is a day coming, and that day is coming where there will be no more grief, and it will be gone. When we will want for nothing. But until then, we trust in the name of Jesus. For as Jesus says in verse 33 of that same chapter, I have told you these things so that in me you may find peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome sin and death. He has overcome the world. And in him we have peace. So let us praise his name forever and ever because of this peace that we have.
I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah's shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus feet. you shall return you shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus perfect and holy name. We trust in it, knowing that you will do a good work in us. Amen. Well, this evening, uh, we have the privilege of gathering together 
uh, online uh, for our regional uh, day of prayer uh, for COVID-19. And this is something that we are participating in uh, along with uh, other fe fellowship churches in our region. And it's really a, a time to uh, bring before the Lord uh, our requests as uh, we continue to face uh, the pandemic and, and all the uh, impact it's had uh, around us. And so um, we encourage you tonight um, to, uh, to join us. Uh, you can find on our, our website uh, how to sign up for that. And uh, there is a register link, and that just allows us to know how many people uh, are going to be there. And what we're going to do when we get there is just uh, break into groups uh, on Zoom and uh, pray for uh, three main things in particular. We want to pray for the crisis of COVID itself. We're going to pray for our political leaders and uh, for our churches. And so uh, if you uh, would like to join us, uh, there's still time to sign up, and we would encourage you to do that. But we just wanted to take a bit of time uh, this morning to pray for some of those things uh, just before we uh, get to our offering. So I'm just going to take um, a few moments um, and uh, pray for those things. And uh, before I pray, I will, this is again this time where we take up our offering usually, so I'm just going to ha have that come up on the screen. One of the ways you can continue to give uh, while we're physically separated, uh, one of the easiest ways is uh, by uh, going to uh, e-transferring at donations at victorybaptist.ca. And we just, uh, we're so thankful for the way that we've seen God continue to provide uh, during these times where we're physically separated. So let's um, bring these requests before the Lord, bring our uh, prayer for the offering before the Lord at this time. Heavenly Father, we come before you uh, humbled by these circumstances that we are faced with. And we're humbled by the fact that you are a God who listens to us despite our sin, despite the fact that uh, we are so undeserving to approach your throne. And we only come before your throne through the blood of Christ that has made access for, a, for us uh, to you. And so we come, Lord, this morning with our requests in the name of Jesus, and we pray for this crisis that we are faced with. We pray for uh, an end, Lord, in your great mercy. May we see an end to COVID and just this, the, the deadly impact we've seen, uh, not only in Canada, but around the world, uh, with so many lives having been taken by this, um, this virus. And we pray, Lord, that in your mercy that you would bring an end to it. We pray for those who are on the front line uh, fighting. Um, and uh, we think of doctors and nurses and uh, care home workers and all those who uh, care for uh, those in need. And uh, we thank you for the sacrifices that many of them have had to make. And we pray, Lord, that you would keep them safe and uh, give them the uh, necessary um, things that they need to do their jobs uh, safely and well. And pray, Lord, that we would um, be conscious of them as we make our decisions, that uh, so many of them have just faced, have felt overwhelmed um, at times, and may we just be conscious of, of them, Lord. We pray for those who have been impacted in their businesses through COVID-19. We pray for those uh, business owners who have had to uh, shut down. Uh, we pray for those who are struggling with uh, a stress and the anxiety and the depression that comes with um, watching your business and your livelihood uh, just be stripped away. Uh, Lord, may you um, just be very real to them, and may you uh, may they sense you as their their provider and their the one who cares for them at this time, and may they turn to you. We all know, we also want to pray for our political leaders. We know, Lord, that um, there may be, there's some of us, Lord, we, we don't agree with uh, all the decisions that are being made, uh, and, uh, but at the same time, we are called to pray for them, Lord, because we know that you have placed them in that position. We pray for them, Lord, as they've had to make tough decisions that uh, we know won't please everybody, and I'm sure that are very stressful for them. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, give them a peace and a wisdom as they uh, make these decisions. 
and they uh, contemplate uh, what would be best for all. And we know, Lord, that many of them do not know you, and we pray, Lord, that through this time that uh, they would, uh, would turn towards the Lord, that they would see, Lord, um, that you, uh, Lord, are, are Lord of all. And uh, we, we pray for, for that, Lord. We also pray for our churches. Uh, we know, Lord, that um, many churches have faced uh, difficulties uh, as they've had to move online. Uh, some, Lord, uh, churches have even shut down. Others uh, have really uh, not been able to transition well. And then others uh, have faced uh, divisiveness within the body, Lord. And uh, we pray for all of our churches, Lord, that through this time um, that we would seek unity, especially as we might disagree, or uh, may we not uh, judge others' consciences or their, their intentions, Lord, um, but may we show humility and grace to others who differ from us. May we be, uh, remain on task, Lord. May we continue to seek out the mission uh, of, of reaching others with the gospel and the good news. Uh, may we prioritize people in our churches, even when we're not able to meet physically. Um, may we find ways to stay connected and encourage one another and love one another. And we pray for, um, for ministry leaders, uh, pastors um, throughout our region. Uh, we know some of the, the stresses that some of them have had to face and um, we pray, Lord, that you would uphold them and strengthen them. And, uh, and Lord, there are so many other requests that we could bring before you. And, uh, Lord, you know those things that we need. And we come before you, Lord. Uh, accept these offerings, Lord, that we bring towards you, that they might go towards the furthering um, of the gospel in uh, our area, in our region, and around the world. And so, Lord, we bring these things before you, and we bring our requests before you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We can turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. We'll be reading from verse 3 to 11. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make any effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our lord jesus christ but whosoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. There was a young man that I want to tell you about. And every day on his way to work, he would drive by this piece of property that had yet been developed. And he would often daydream about owning it and building a home on it for himself. And before long, the property went up for sale and he purchased it. He then got to work right away. He, he prepared the property for construction. He dug the basement and he poured the foundation for his house. And after the foundation of his house was poured, he stopped work and moved right in. From that day on, he, had, he added nothing to the foundation of his house. 
He made no effort to build any further. It was simply a large hole in the ground. And everyone who drove by this piece of property would ask, why would you lay a foundation and then never add anything to it? It it doesn't make sense, does it? Here's another story. There was an older woman who lived at the center of town. She had this large front yard that faced the main street. And one day, the people in town noticed this woman marking out her front lawn. She was preparing and planning to put a large vegetable garden in. And day after day, they watched her work. She removed the sod. She turned the soil. She got rid of all the rocks. She she laid out all the rows. And then she planted the seed. And after the seed was planted, she stopped her work and went inside. And from that day on, she never attended to her garden again. She never watered it once. She never pulled one weed. And everyone in town would ask, why would you plant all that seed and never work at growing it? It doesn't make sense, does it? It's like this for us and our faith. Does it seem wise to put your faith in Jesus and then make no effort to add anything to your faith? Does it seem wise to put your faith in Jesus and then make no effort to ever tend to your faith? The young man's goal of laying a solid foundation should have been to complete the home he had started to build. The woman's goal of planting a vegetable garden should have been to grow food to eat. The goal of our faith is to become like Jesus. And we do not become like Jesus in the moment that we put our faith in him, but we must grow to be like him. Just as an infant is born and then will grow into a man or a woman, We are born again through Christ, and as spiritual infants, we must grow to be like Jesus. And Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1, verse 4, God has provided us with a great privilege in Christ, and that is we may participate in the divine nature. And the divine nature can be understood as this, God's character. In Christ, we are able to take part in God's character. We, are to, we can be like Him in who we are. And this does not mean that we become God, but as Christians, our character starts to reflect God's character. And in the character of God, there is no sin. And as we grow in Christ, we stop sinning and we start acting more and more like Jesus. You know, have you ever known two people who, who spend a lot of time together? And often what you will see is one, one of their characters will rub off on the other, and before long they really start acting like one another. And it's like th- this with us and Jesus. The more time that we spend with Jesus, the more his character rubs off on us, And we become more and more like him. And one day, all who believe in Jesus will be like him. And that is the goal of our faith, to be like Christ. One day, we will be morally perfected. There will be no more sin at work within us. In 1 John 3.3, we are told this. We know that when Christ appears, we will be like him. This transformation that we will undergo is a work of God. Now, if the goal of our faith is to become like Jesus, should we not be eager to work towards that end? And Peter says yes. Peter tells us in verse 5, make every effort to add to your faith. Now, we know that we are saved by faith and faith alone. We are not saved by works, but we are to add to our faith. Faith that saves is never alone. And we are told to add to our faith. Peter Peter tells us to make every effort to do so. We are to build on the foundation that has been laid within us through faith, and that our foundation is Christ. We are to tend to the seed that has been planted in us through faith so that we may grow in Christ. Peter tells us, make every effort to add to your faith. 
This morning we are looking at the second step in our discipleship pathway, which is grow. And over the past five weeks, we have been casting our vision for this church. And we're going to put the vision statement up on the screen for you. Our vision is to build a Christ-centered ministry that boldly reaches people in our community with the gospel and effectively leads and equips them in an active life of discipleship with Jesus. You see, when I look to the future for our church, I picture us building a ministry that will help people grow in Christ. I see us creating a life-changing ministry where people will are able to come as themselves and find healing in Christ and freedom from sin. And to help us realize this vision, we have, we have developed the discipleship pathway. We believe that each of the characteristics on this pathway are key steps of faith that we need to take in discipleship with Jesus. And as you see it on your screen, you see the different steps that we take. And our hope for each one of us is that we accept Christ, that we grow in Christ, that we commit to Christ, that we serve Christ, and that we share Christ. And each of these steps are steps that each one of us should take as we become more and more like Jesus. It's not like some people only accept Christ while others only serve Christ. A disciple of Jesus should have each of these characteristics at work within them. And at the center of this pathway is the hub of our ministry, which is corporate worship. And corporate worship is where we gather together as the visible body of Christ to worship God and to build one another up in faith. And last week we talked about the first step on the pathway, which is accept. A person enters a life of discipleship with Jesus when they accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. But what, what's next? for a person after they put their faith in Jesus. What am I to do now that I'm a Christian? And people just don't automatically know. We need to be discipled. We need disciples of Jesus to walk along beside us and show us what it is to follow Jesus. I myself have people in my life that I look to so that I may learn what it is to follow Jesus and see their example. The next step in faith is to grow in Christ. And as Peter tells us, we are to make every effort to add to our faith. So let's take a look at what Peter has to teach us about growing. If you're not already there, please turn with me in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. See, if we are to grow in Christ, we need to be in the Word of God. As a Christian... Not to be in the Word of God is like neglecting to water your garden. You will not grow in Christ without the Word of God. So let's just take a moment and pause here and ask the Lord to bear fruit within us this morning. A gracious Heavenly Father, You alone are great and high above, and great are Your deeds. Forever you are exalted. You have given us new life in Christ. Our sin has been taken away by Jesus on the cross. We ask that you fill us with your love and your wisdom this morning so that we may be conformed to the image of your Son. Jesus, you are our example. We ask that you lead us in all your ways. You are our God and Savior. Strengthen us in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit as your word is proclaimed. And may we be a people who love you with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The passage that we are studying this morning is found in Peter's second letter. The purpose of his letter is to encourage Christians to grow in Christian virtue, to become less like the world and more like Christ. 
And this may seem like a difficult task for us, being that Jesus is perfect, but Peter assures us that we are able to grow in Christ. And the reason we are able to grow is not because of our power, but because of God's power. And what Peter teaches us in verses 3 and 4 is this. God has given us everything we need to grow in Christ. God has given us everything we need to grow in Christ. And I believe that Peter's word to us accomplishes two things. One, it takes the pressure off of us. God is not expecting us to be someone um, we do not have the power to be. He has given us the power to become more like Christ. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling within us, and the role of the Spirit is to make us more and more like Jesus. And the second thing Peter's word does uh, is take away our excuses. I think many of us believe that we are held captive by our disposition. We often think that we cannot be changed. And as if God does not have the power to teach someone who is angry all the time how to love. Or that God does not have the power to teach someone who is prideful to be humble. I want you to think of the video that we opened up the service with uh, this morning. With God as the potter and we are the clay. God has the, the power to mold his people in, in, into the likeness of his son. You know, we, he, he can form us and, and mold us so that we are kind like Jesus. We are generous like Jesus. We are forgiving like Jesus. We are loving like Jesus. To think God can't mold us into the likeness of his son is to resist God and to minimize his power. If he was able to create the world by the power of his word, I do not think that you're any match for him. Do not resist him. Let him do his work in you. You are in the capable hands of our loving Heavenly Father. I want you to look at what Peter tells us in verses 3 and 4. He first says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. Or in other words, God has given us everything we need for eternal life and godliness. And I believe what is important for us to understand about eternal life is it's not just merely a state of complete happiness and joy. It's not just us getting to heaven. But eternal life involves this complete transformation of ourselves so that we are morally perfected and that we are made like Christ. And I think we can overlook this and miss the goal of our faith. The goal of our faith is to live a godly life. A godly life is the life that is lived in full obedience to God, where his character is fully reflected within all areas of ourselves and who we are, whether that is public or private. And I want you to for a moment, let's, let's think about the future. Our future as Christians. After Christ returns, after the resurrection of the dead, after sin and, and corruption is no more, after God has made a new heaven and new earth, and after God has established us on the new earth, and, and, and we are there living with God as he dwells amongst us, what kind of life do you think that you will live? For you will be in a world where there is no sin. You see, in eternity, you will live a godly life. Every ounce of you will live for God. Your every moment will be conformed to his will and his character. And it's hard to imagine, but to be assured of this, God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. And we are to begin working towards that goal. Peter then tells us how we receive God's power for this life. He says it comes through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. We receive God's power for a godly life through our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Through faith in him. 
Peter then says, through these, being Christ's glory and goodness, from verse 3, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them, through these promises, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. God promises that in Christ that we will have the power to live a life that reflects his perfection. In Christ, we have escaped sin's control. This is not by our own doing, but it came by way of the cross. We have been bought. Our freedom has been bought by the precious blood of Christ. And the question that we need to ask is this. If God has gone to such great lengths to give us the privilege of living a godly life, if God has given us everything that we need to grow in Christ, what should we do with that gift? We should make every effort to grow. We should make every effort to grow. The opportunity to live a godly life is a privilege that we have been afforded by Christ and his sacrifice for us. And we should not waste such a precious gift. Think of this. If you knew someone who could not afford to go to university and you offered to pay uh, for their tuition, their books, their housing, their feed, or their food, You offer them everything they needed for a university education. And if they accepted your great gift, what would you expect them to do? Would you expect them to apply themselves at school and work for that education? Or would you be fine if they wasted that gift and just partied it all away? We would want them to work. We would expect some A's to come home. And the same principle is here in this passage. Paul tells us in verse 5, for this very reason, or in other words, because God has given us everything we need to live a godly life through faith, make every effort to add to your faith. Meaning we are to put our faith to work. This free gift of life is not to be wasted. God has given us the power to grow in Christ. We need to take hold of it and put the effort in. Peter lists the virtues that we are to add to our faith, and this is not necessarily to be considered as an exhaustive list, nor should it be thought of as as we are to master each one in sequence before we move on to the next, but instead they, they are all interconnected, and we should grow in each one simultaneously. He tells us, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self control, and to self control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Peter tells us we are to make every effort to grow in these virtues. So let's take a few minutes just to to look at each one of them. First of all, I just I encourage you, before we look at these, I encourage you to spend some personal time looking at each one of these and, and considering these things and spend that time with God. Ask Him to show you where you are to add these to your life and how can you add these to your life and, and ask Him to show you what you might have to take away in order to make room for these. We should make every effort to add to our faith goodness. Goodness is moral excellence. We are to practice, as Christians, moral excellence. And remember, moral excellence is judged by God's standard, not our own. We we do not set what is right or wrong. We should seek to do what is right in God's sight and not what is wrong. We're to add knowledge 
This is the knowledge of God that comes from having a personal relationship with Him. It is the knowledge that seeks to apply what we have learned uh, in, to our life. We're to grow in our knowledge of God's will for us and then put our knowledge to work. You know, take, take this passage as an example. We have gained the knowledge that we are to add to our faith. However, we walk away from this and make no effort to add to our faith. We have wasted our knowledge and have added nothing. We gain this knowledge from time spent in God's Word. We are to add self-control to our faith or self Restraint To live a godly life requires self-discipline. We are to resist the evil desires uh, uh, of our sinful self. Instead, seek the desires of God. And self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. God gives us the power to resist temptation and he equally gives us the power to be obedient to Him. We're to add perseverance to our faith or endurance we are to patiently wait for God in all types of seasons, whether in pain or in persecution. We are to persevere in our faith. We are to be willing to follow Jesus even when it's not popular or easy to do. We are to hold on to those promises of God and stay the course. We are to add godliness. And godliness is to, to live in full obedience to God where His character is fully reflected in us in all areas of our life, whether public or private. We are to live like Jesus. And as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of when Jesus washed the feet of His disciples. He, he humbled Himself. He, he knelt down and washed their feet. And He said to them in John 13, 4, Now that I, your Lord and Teacher, have washed your feet you also should wash one another's feet. Jesus is our example of godliness. It is a humbling growth. Like many of us have to grow down instead of grow up. We're to add mutual affection. Mutual affection is the love for all believers. See, we, we are to love the family of God. As a church, we should pursue a family-like devotion with one another. We are to be brothers and sisters in Christ. And remember this, we're all going to be spending eternity together, and in eternity, we will love one another co completely. So we better get used to it now. And I know there are some Christians who are tough to love, and I'm sure I've made it on a few people's lists. But think of this, when you get to heaven and all those things you don't like about that, when you get to heaven all those things you don't like about that person will be gone, and all those things they don't like about you will be gone too. And one day we will live perfectly in Christian love and unity. Jesus expects us to make the effort now so that the world will get a glimpse of what eternity will look like. And to close the list off, we are to add love. This is agape love. Agape love is, is the most powerful type of love. It is sacrificial love. This is the love that God has shown His people. God has shown this love for you and I. It's because of this love that He sacrifices one and only Son on the cross for our sins. And Jesus said in John 15:13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Christ has loved us this way, and He has commanded us, love each other as I have loved you. We are to lay our life down for one another in love. And when you're having trouble loving someone, I want you to take a moment and remember the love that Christ has shown you. See, none of us are easy to love. Sin gets in the way. Jesus made a personal sacrifice to love each one of us. We need to get over ourselves and make the effort to love. If you're a new Christian and you're wondering what you're supposed to be doing as a Christian, here's the list. It's, it's the list for, for all of us. Write it down 
print it off, memorize it, put it on the fridge. These are the things that we are to put to work in our faith. We should make every effort to grow in Christ in this way. And this growth helps us. And this is what it does. Growing in Christ keeps us strong and sure of our salvation. Growing in Christ keeps us strong in our faith and sure of our salvation. Peter tells us in verse 8, For if you possess these qualities, the ones he just listed, in increasing measure, we're not just to fill our cups halfway with these virtues, but we're to fill our cup to overflowing with these virtues of Christ. And this is what they will do for you. They will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Peter is saying that if we do not add these things to our faith, we will be ineffective and unproductive in our Christian life. It will be as if we had forgotten that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Or said in the positive, if we add these virtues to our faith, we will be effective and productive as Christians. Practicing these virtues and, and making them a part of who we are strengthens us in our faith. You know, practicing love is, is like lifting weights, you know, to, to tone our faith. You know, practicing perseverance is like going for a daily jog to in, increase our faith capacity. And we, when we practice these things, we are relying on God, we are focused on God, and time spent with God strengthens our faith. And not only do these virtues strengthen our faith, these virtues are the evidence that we have a genuine saving faith in Christ. They are the proof that we believe in Jesus. And I want to explain it this way. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Meaning our actions demonstrate what we believe. If a person professes their faith in Jesus and their love for him, and yet they never obey his commands, the question is this. Do they truly believe in Jesus and love him? And if that person says, yes, I do, then the question is, why don't you obey Jesus? Because as Jesus said, obedience proves our love for God. If you show no sign of obedience... You show no signs of a love for God. And the deeper question is this. If our faith is unproductive and ineffective, are we truly saved? Peter goes on to say in verse 10, My brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. Or in other words, make every effort to show that you have a genuine faith. Be obedient to Christ. Work at developing these qualities because they are the proof that you have a genuine faith in Christ and that you are saved. He says, for if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, Peter is not saying that if we do these things, we earn our salvation. Peter is not teaching salvation by works. But Peter is teaching a salvation with works. Faith and deeds go hand in hand. When we do these things that Peter listed out of a love for God, they prove that we have a genuine faith in Christ. And therefore, we can be sure of our salvation. We prove our faith to be authentic by what we do in faith. It's like this. You know, if someone at work told you that they were a Christian, and then later that week they were fired because they had been caught stealing from the company, would you not ask, is that person even a Christian? Or at least, what, what type of Christian are they? And the answer is we would. And the reason we would ask such a question is because we know our actions reflect our faith. If a person is always sinning, does Christ truly rule their life? Now this is not to say that as Christians we will never sin. We do. 
And thankfully, the Lord forgives us, and he's faithful to do so when we confess our sin. But it is to say that a person with a genuine saving faith in Christ should be seen running from sin far more often than running towards it. Growing in Christ keeps us strong in our faith and sure of our salvation. We should make every effort to grow in Christ. And my question to us as a church is this. How will we develop a ministry here at the church that will help believers grow in Christ and continue to grow? We want to build a ministry that will first introduce people to Jesus so that they may accept him as Lord and Savior and be saved. For it is by faith we are saved, but we do not want to see that faith left alone. We want to help those who are new in Christ learn that they need to make every effort to add to their faith. We are to grow in Christ after we accept him. And I know there are some, we have Bible studies uh, that offer that we offer the church, and believers are able to grow in Christ through these studies, and I'm thankful for those ministries. But I see two things that we need to develop in our ministry here at the church. We need to develop a ministry that helps lay a firm faith foundation in a new believer's life and teach them that they need to build on that foundation. You know, I have spoken with new believers, and many are unaware of the changes that Christ brings into their life. See, we have all been indoctrinated by the world, and what is accepted by the world is not accepted by God. We need to help people know that in Christ they have escaped the corruption of the world, and there is a new way to live. The other thing I want to see us develop is a baptism class. We need to teach believers about baptism and make it easy for them to take that next step of faith with Jesus. And I'll say this, it's not a class that makes disciples. It's disciples who makes disciples. We need to develop material, but more so we need to develop disciples. Our vision is to create a life-changing ministry here at Victory Baptist Church where believers can grow in Christ. And we re need to remember that growing in Christ is not just for new believers, but is a lifelong process for all believers. We are still under construction. We, 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 are, still, we are still learning and growing. And it won't be until Christ returns that every one of us will be complete. I'm going to close this with a story I read the other day. Years ago, Ruth Bell Graham, who's the wife of Billy Graham, the evangelist, she was out for a drive, and while on the drive, she passed through uh, some construction. And when she came to the end of the construction zone, there was this sign uh, on the side of the road that she saw, and it said, End of construction. Thank you for your patience. The sign made her smile, and she said, I would love those words written on my gravestone. And after her death in 2007, her, her wish was carried out, and there, written on her gravestone, read the words, End of construction. Thank you for your patience. Remember this. We are all still under construction. Be patient with one another. For one day we will be complete. One day we will be fully grown. For we know that when Christ appears, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. And there, in eternity, we will live a godly life. Make every effort to add to your faith. Make every effort to grow in Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we praise you for the gift of life. That in your love for us, you sacrificed your Son so that we may be set free from sin, so that we may escape the corruption of this world caused by evil desires. And Lord, you have called us to a new life, a godly life, where we are conformed to the image of your Son, and Lord, we just pray in your power through your Holy Spirit that you 
Help each one of us take those next steps to grow in our faith. And may, as we go through our week, spend time in reflection on this list of virtues that Peter has laid out for us, that we may add these to our faith, that we may be known as believers by what we do, by the love that we show. And God, we know that we, we wrestle with these things at times, but you are so gracious. You have given us the power to live this out. We have assurance in you. I pray, Lord, that we grow as a church in our love for you. And Lord, I pray you grow this ministry here that we see, may see many put their faith in Christ and then take that next step and begin to add to their faith. We love you, mighty God. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite Pastor Scott and the band up to close us in a song. God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you, and I will seek you in the morning. And I will learn to walk in your ways And step by step you'll lead me And I will follow you all of my days Oh God, you are my God And I will ever praise you Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you, and I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Sing it again. But you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. And I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your way, and step by step. You lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. Oh God, you are my God, yes he is, and I will ever praise you. And I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step, you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Lord, we follow after you. I just want to close us with a, a final announcement. I talked last week about a, a mission survey that would be coming up uh, this week. And, 
I just want to remind you, at the beginning of last year, we had started to work with a mission coach, Richard Fleming, who was from Feb Central. And Richard was leading a group of us through a process that would help us discover uh, what we are passionate about in regards to missions. And knowing what we are passionate about uh, allows us to make better decisions and plans for reaching our world for Jesus Christ that truly reflect our collective personality as a church. And through this process, there are two things that we want to learn about ourselves. One, what type of mission work are we passionate about financially supporting and participating in? And two, who are the people that we want to reach and in what context do we want to reach them? And to help us answer these two questions, we are going to complete two surveys. And I want you to watch for your emails this week. We're going to be sending out the first survey tomorrow morning. And the first survey is designed to help us understand what type of mission work we are, we are passionate about financially supporting and participating in. And this is what I want you to do when you get the survey. First of all, please complete the survey. That's important. But don't rush through it. I want you to prayerfully consider the options in front of you as you work through it. And the information that we collect is key in determining the future mission work that we will financially support and participate in as a church. And as you select your answers, I, I want you to think of it in two ways. The first way, you kind of get this mindset in. If, if you were financially supporting a missionary or mission organization, what work would you be most passionate about supporting? And two, if you were to go on a short-term mission, what work would you be most passionate about participating in? The deadline for this survey will be next uh, Monday, Monday, February 15th, and then the following week we will complete the second survey. And what I, what I want is I want as many of us to complete this survey as possible. Whether you're a youth, junior high, young adult, and all the way up, I would love to hear from each one of us. Because what you are passionate about, the way that God has equipped you and shaped you, collectively, when we pool all this information together, will help shape the heart our church has for missions. And I want you to be a part of that. So may the Lord direct our hearts and minds as we consider the areas of missions so that we may know his will for us. And I also, don't forget tonight, we have our prayer meeting. Uh, you can sign up online. We ask you to do that so that we're just prepared for you coming. We can send you the Zoom invite. And as you go into your week, I want you to remember this. God has given us everything we need to live a godly life. We need to make that effort to grow in Christ. And as Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1-2, grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you as you go into your week.